This is a WDIV production. so damn tight, you know, you try to fight, it just cuts into you. How can you just kill a 12 year old in the middle of a very busy intersection and no one knows anything? How can that be? Their bodies were tossed by public roadsides, almost as if to taunt officers. We were being told that these were isolated incidents, they were working on them, and, and, and to be careful, but there still was no child killer out there that was a serial type of killer. So our communities were on edge. However, we thought our authorities were solving these crimes and it would all go away. I'm guessing he was disguised as a police officer, disguised as a priest. Pretty much at a standstill unless some people stepped forward. The whole community was in terror. We don't know how he was asphyxiated. He could have been asphyxiated by somebody holding a pillow over his face. He could have been asphyxiated in a trunk of a car that didn't leak air. There were uh, unusual aspects to this beyond the horror of a child being abducted. My sister had premonitions that she was going to die. She knew she was going to die. Money does a lot of strange things to people. It can do anything. Oakland County enjoyed back then, and still does today, enjoys the reputation of being a safe community, good place to raise a family, good schools and so forth. So to have four kids kidnapped and murdered right in the middle of the 70s in this county, uh, it was just a, it was surreal. Oakland County is the wealthiest county in Michigan. It is now, and it was then in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, we grew up in Ferndale couple blocks south of Nine Mile, and you know, west or east of Woodward. It was a good neighborhood, and all the neighbors were good there. On February 15th, 1976, Mark Stebbins was walking home from uh, the American Legion at Livernois and Nine Mile, where his mother worked. She worked as a bartender at the American Legion Hall in Ferndale, and there was a pool tournament there. And he wanted to go home to watch a movie. I think it was 30 seconds over Tokyo, because he was a war boss. And when I got there and he wasn't there, it's like, Something's wrong with this picture. We don't know where exactly he was picked up. My mom called from the American Legion. She asked me, is Mark there? I'm like, no. And she's like, well, I don't understand that. He headed home and never made it. And the Ferndale police says, well, we have to wait about 24 hours to report a missing person. And it's like, for a child, you know, a 12-year-old kid, you gotta wait 24 hours. No one heard anything, no one saw anything. He was missing for four days. Then on the 19th, the bottom of the world just dropped out. Four days later, his body was found at a 
behind an office complex at 10 and Greenfield. A uh, person walking his dog in a, a strip mall in Southfield. I think it was called Fairfax Plaza saw something against a short brick wall and he said he thought it was a mannequin. You know, he walked up and it was a small, a body of a small boy. Why would somebody take my brother off the street and do such brutal things and murder him? And I beat myself up for a long time, a lot of years. And it's like, I thought to myself, well, what if I would have walked home with him? Would he have made it? Or who knows, would they have tried to get both of us? I have no idea. No specific suspects. Uh, we're looking into a background of a lot of people who have got backgrounds of uh, this type of offense right now. After the killing of Mark Stebbins, real fear shot through the community, real fear uh, on the point of hysteria. December 22nd, um, Jill is at home in Royal Oak. They had recently moved to Royal Oak. Uh, her mom was divorced. Her mom, Carol Robinson. They'd separated when, when the youngest was a baby. I am Jill Robinson's sister. I was nine and she was 12. And mom and my two sisters and I lived in Detroit growing up and then we moved out of there to be in a safer neighborhood. Jill was not in a good mood that night. Early reports had indicated uh, she had a fight with her mother. Carol repeatedly asked her, what's wrong, honey, what's wrong? She packed a backpack, got on her bike, and then left. I haven't seen her since, and I wasn't really very worried for an hour or so because she's very stubborn, and I thought she'll stand in the next yard and, and think about it and or go around the block or something, and then I thought maybe she went to visit her father. Ah, this is where it gets hard. Okay, so then I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I'm not gonna cry, but anyways, so she becomes missing off of her bike. Her father lived some distance away, so what she did is she packed a backpack, got on her bike, and then left. And that is the last anyone of it had ever seen of her. I said, Jill, where are you going? She said, none of your business. And I'm, I'm the one that was the last one to see her, and I had to go out to the shed to look for her bike, because my mom was gone to work or something. And and so I had to go out and look, and her bike was gone. So I think that she went to my dad's, which was like five miles down the road, six in Birmingham. And she was last seen somewhere along the way at Tiny Tim's Hobby Shop or whatever that was called. I don't know. I thought somebody found you. It's okay. Mrs. Robinson is especially worried because today, Christmas, is something that Jill was really looking forward to. She had saved enough money from her allowance to buy gifts, gifts that still remain unopened. She was missing from December 21st, and then they found her the day after Christmas. I remember like we couldn't open our presents. We didn't open our presents. We were waiting. She was gone. It wasn't even Christmas. I don't even know what I got. It doesn't matter. But uh, the day after Christmas, I was there when the cop came to the door and said, your sister's been shot in the head and found in the middle of I-75 in Big Beaver. And I remember my mom just reacting and being how do you react to that? So very sad and uh. so 
so they said that she was, um, you know, shot in the face and her body was found. And it's unbelievable to me that someone doesn't know something about her whereabouts from those days that she was missing. Because how can you just kill a 12-year-old in the middle of a very busy intersection and no one knows anything? How can that be? So. I knew I had a great news story here. And I went on the air in our next newscast and did the story about the Oakland County child killer. It was the first time, I think, that anyone had ever uttered those words in our area. I think it's worthwhile. I, we have to find the girl. We need information to find the girl, uh, no matter what the situation is. And that's why I'm here. I think this is the only way we can do it. You can't keep someone for 19 days or four days or, or whatever it is and, and be a single individual. I just think it would be next to impossible. It will be a week tomorrow since Christine Mihalik disappeared while coming home from this store. In those six days, the community has come to realize that a missing child in this area is not merely the problem of the parents. Most of those out collecting funds today have families also. I can remember riding our bikes. Um, at the time, it seems like it would have been behind all of the uh, storefronts there on 12 Mile on the north side. I think they maybe had like alleys and parking lots by them. And I remember riding our bikes with the neighborhood kids uh, throughout that particular area. And really, that's about it and a few other memories that we had at our family cottage up north. I only have one memory that I recall from when she went missing and it would have been um, my grandmother and I were laying in bed watching TV and I remember seeing the news flash coming up with her picture in terms of missing and, and, and the news channels asking if anyone had seen her and I remember asking her you know why is Chris's picture on TV I couldn't I couldn't figure that out and I'm sure my parents probably did not tell me essentially you know what was happening and if they did it, it certainly didn't recollect in my thoughts in terms of what was happening in terms of the scenario the money is being used for war for apprehensions of persons or persons who are holding Christine I knew about it as a as a young man thank you very much I was lived in Berkeley, grew up in Berkeley in the 70s. My dad was a Berkeley detective. Um, he grew up with Bob Bell, who was Christine Mihalik's grandfather. Christine was kept for 19 days. I thought it was just so poignant that her mom said, Deborah Jarvis said the reason she was kept for 19 days is because they so enjoyed her company because she was such a sweet, her body was found 19 days later um, in Franklin Township, uh, partially buried in a snowbank. Later found at uh, Bruce Lane in Franklin, Michigan, um, which 13 in Telegraph area, dumped in the snow and uh, um, I believe a mailman spotted her body that day. She was found. It's just a place that you can't go and think about um, where she would have been for 19 days and what she would have gone through. Um, I just simply I can't go there. Jim was inducted on March 16, 1977, sexually abused and suffocated on March 22nd. So now police know they have a serial child killer on their hands and they organized the largest manhunt in U.S. history at the time. There were differences between each case, different enough that we just couldn't connect all the dots. But when Timothy King was found murdered, things became very clear. Barry and Marion were with a client having dinner there. 
Uh, Kathy was on her way to go see Jerry Lewis. His sister Kathy had given him some change to go down to the corner store, Maple, Hunter Maple Pharmacy, to get some candy. Mark had a babysitting job that night. And the other was working on a school play at high school. Mark had the lead in the ninth grade play up here and they were, wanted him to come up for that, so Chris went to babysit. He was 11 or 12 years old, took his skateboard, went down the street. And was never seen again. The key to Timothy King's disappearance is still the rear door here at the Hunter Maple Pharmacy. This is where the youngster was last seen leaving at 8.30 Wednesday night. I don't feel bad about taking Marion out to dinner. I don't feel bad about the other kids going where they went. Uh, so I, I don't, I, I wouldn't have made any decisions the other way. And authorities are saying that somebody must have seen something that evening, and they're asking people to come forward. The family of Timothy King went public and begged the killer to let their child live and to release Tim. Somebody from television came to me and I just thought I was talking to Tim. Well, I want to say hi to Tim. Uh, we love you, Tim. God bless you. Uh, stay tough. I have one other statement to those persons or person who may be with Tim. Uh, I don't know if you have children or if you want to have some, but please treat Tim the same way you would your own kid. Uh, talk to him. He's a talkative kid if you've spent some time with him. This street will be closed until probably sometime late this afternoon to allow the crime lab people to do the thorough job that we have asked of them. Tentatively, the body of the young lad down there is Timothy King. What's, Are they what? checking license numbers and cars thoroughly to see perhaps if there's a suspect in the area? Gentlemen, we're doing a number of things that we can't release right at this time. I still feel the most important aspect is the investigation and get this animal off the street. I'm convinced to this day that when Timmy was kidnapped, he knew what was going to happen to him. And as an 11-year-old kid, there was nothing he could do about it. I can't imagine anybody doing what they're doing. And I can't imagine people not turning people in that do that. But uh, I, I can't change society. I'm not afraid to, to tell the story now. Even as a grown man, you know, you got that little boy inside you that doesn't want to tell anybody. Um, that little boy died a long time ago, so. Sam! There is a theory that the pedophile community may have someone in it that committed these murders. I know there's questions about whether the four children that were killed in Oakland County that we know of, uh, did some of that happen on North Fox Island? I was actually writing the history. I published the first book, uh, They Came to South Fox Island in 1982, but I wanted to update it to add, to include North Fox. 
And when I was almost through with that book, that's when the whole Sheldon pornography thing broke. So it, it was just a beginning story when I was trying to wrap up my book. Uh, he had property on North Fox Island, and we accessed the information about him through the school teacher that was arrested by the detective sergeant in St. Clair. Um, he would fly friends and males that were interested in interacting to his property on North Fox Island. Really what he bought it for and installed the land strip for was to run a child pornography operation there. And he had a private jet and he'd fly kids from Charlevoix to the island and um, had a filming operation there and had you know, horrible, horrible things. I grew up in Port Huron. Um, we were pretty well off as far as as far as a family went. Um, that's why I went to St. Joe's, and um, yeah, it was it was good. It was a, it was a good childhood actually. I mean, I, I had heard about nuns. You know, the old school Roman Catholic nuns. They don't play, um, and that's true. Um, but you know, learn discipline, and um, I liked it. We were poor, but we had uniforms. So this kid that I sat next to, his father's a judge, but we still we dressed the same. My mom was a maid, but we still dressed the same. So that part about it, I liked. I don't remember the name of the, the gym instructor before him, um, but he was a really good guy, and he left. And that's when Mr. Richards came. Yeah, he would do the padding on the ass. Um, the only gym, gym teacher I ever had that would be in the shower, in the locker room when we were taking showers. Frank Sheldon was introduced to us as Mr. Richards' uncle. This is my uncle Frank. So, oh, okay, well, this is Frank, and Frank owns the island and whatever, and we're, you know, so. Wealthy man. Um, anybody from that area knew, you know, he was very prominent, wealthy, come from wealthy family, and so on. From what I understood, he went to a couple of the other boys and myself's parents and said, these guys did an exceptional job this year in gym class, and as a reward, we'd like to take them up to the island. I remember just taking off, it's like rock stars. I'm in a plane, I've never been in a plane before. You know, I'm just a poor kid who lives in the projects. Got lucky enough to get a tuition to a Catholic school. Um, yeah, it, it, was really, it was really cool. It was exciting. From the moment the plane took off till we came back, everything we did on the island, myself, was great. The island was beautiful. It really, it was a really cool place. And we go down, the water was like, it almost looked like the ocean, but it was freezing. And I remember landing. I remember getting our stuff, getting our cabin. And, you know, within an hour, we were naked on the beach. That's just how it was. If you live on an island, this is how they do it, an island, so. Okay. Again, 11 years old, I, I assume I was protected. That's my gym teacher right there. I started getting older and I was thinking, wow, you know, they, they used our innocence, and that, that sucks. Right to the beach. You know, just leave your clothes and, you know, you can bring a towel, put it in peace, but the boys had to be naked, and that's just how it was. Um, so once again, they played on our trust. Um, but yeah, but there's times we could just go, you know, be boys. You know, but they focused on me a lot, I noticed. Um, long blonde hair, blue eyed, 11 year old. You know, um, the very first day we were there and I had a sunburn and Jerry Richards rubbed lotion on me everywhere. I remember him taking lotion and putting it on his hand here and then just me laying on my stomach and just going between my, um, my cheeks you know, with, with his hand like that. And, and I felt very uncomfortable, but he assured me everything was okay and this is what we're supposed to do. Again, I trusted him. You know, turn over, do the same thing because you have to protect that. You know, so every day he did that to me. Uh, Sheldon, 
Um, him, he said the same thing too. This is how things are. You know, this is my island. I own this island. Blah blah blah. And and you kids are lucky and fortunate to be here. You know, so basically just adhere to these rules. Um, and and this is how we we are here. You know, and they were naked as well. There was a stump, and it was probably all about the size around as this chair, maybe four or five feet long. And I remember there was snakes in the end of it. So I rolled the thing, I like rolled it with the bottom ripped off of it, and there was literally thousands of snakes in this thing. I go back and I get Bill, and I said, you gotta see these snakes. He's like, I don't really care for snakes. I said, well, come on, you gotta see this. This is really, I just, I wanted to show somebody. There's cameras by the trail that we took. Mike and I would go, you know, catch snakes and salamanders and just do what boys do. And there's cameras, you know, a lot all over the place, really. Well, when we got back, we couldn't find any. You know, usually there was somebody right around the main cabin and there was nobody there. I want to say it was, it was probably a couple hours. Then they came back and that was, they were happy, but the, but the, the two boys were different after they were quiet. I don't know if it's the exact same time, but I remember hearing one of the kids screaming and crying, like somebody was hurting him and he was screaming and yelling, stop. And we didn't know what was going on, and we knew it was coming from a locked door. There's nothing we could do except for take off running, you know, which is what we did. Now, I don't know if it's that same time, and I remember the tree trunk full of snakes, because that was cool, you know, wow. You know, we're 11. But, but we heard the kid uh, crying. I think it was a kid that was a grade above us. Um, heard him screaming and crying to stop. Um, yeah, I remember that very vividly. Um, I don't think he really talked much. He didn't talk a lot before, but he didn't talk really at all after that. They didn't talk anymore. I think Mike was the lucky one. Uh, just, just his natural curiosity to run and, you know, and be a boy and look around, you know, kept him safe, you know, and I'm glad for him. Um, I wasn't as fortunate. It's like it didn't sink in as, wow, these kids went through an awful hell and, you know, until, I started getting older and I was thinking, wow, you know, they, they used our innocence and that, that sucks. He asked if, if I could put some lotion on, on him and I was very hesitant and I knew that, that I shouldn't do that. He said, well, you know, I did you and you should, you should do that for me, that kind of thing. Um, so I did. I knew it was wrong. Um, It, it, it's hard to do, it's hard to describe. I, yeah, I, I felt shameful. I knew it was wrong, something I shouldn't have done. And I'm thinking, in my 11-year-old mind, I never had nothing to say at confession because we used to go to confession once a week. And I never had anything to say at confession because I never did anything wrong. This is definitely wrong, so I'm definitely gonna have to tell the priest this. So I felt bad, should I say it? And, and they got you thinking, you know, you have to confess you know, your sins in order to be forgiven. This is how we were taught. Um, so I think my biggest worry was if I should tell the priest or should I tell my mom I should keep it to myself. They said oh, I'm going to get in trouble, but I might get in trouble if I tell it to the priest. You know, so a lot of mixed emotions. Uh, it was a really messed up time, I guess. Um, yeah. I went back. in my 20s to, to look for him. And I was telling my wife this story and, and uh, she said, did you ever find him? And I said, I'm telling you the story. No, I didn't because I would have killed him. So then I went looking for his grave. Never could find that either. So just kind of been buried for a long time. I don't know that there's a real strong connection between what was going on on Fox Island and our kids. A theory becomes a narrative, and the narrative then becomes the story. For example, the gremlin. The gremlin. Blue gremlin. Blue gremlin. A gremlin. Gremlin. Blue gremlin. Blue gremlins. He was wearing a rust-colored sport jacket with dark pants. He's soft-spoken. We believe that he's driving a late model blue gremlin 
with white wall tires. The gremlin took off from there because they had an actual eyewitness who saw Tim standing next to a gremlin. Certainly in the height of hysteria, with so little to go on, I can see why it would. And I recall as late <clears throat> as July 1, 1978, the standard ad, $100,000, uh, had only a blue gremlin on it. A sketch was disseminated around the public that people my age remember very clearly. A man, a white male in his 30s with dark hair and long sideburns who was connected to a blue AMC gremlin. That was the image that was passed around in thousands of flyers all around our region. I said, look, you guys stop the cars. If you, if, if you, I'll take the heat. Because you normally have to have a probable cause to make a stop. I said, if you see a car that looks suspicious, go ahead, stop it, and search it. And not, if there's any you know, backlash uh, because of the Fourth Amendment protections, uh, I'll, I'll stand for it. Brooks actually suspended the Fourth Amendment in Oakland County while this investigation was going on. If you drove a, a gremlin in Oakland County, you're getting pulled over and the car was getting searched. What a gross waste of resources quite honestly, and, and to this day, it is felt that it is the gremlin that is involved in this. We stopped cars all over Oakland County for the next couple of days, very little probable cause, if any, not one motorist complained. They, they wanted to help, sure, open the truck. If you saw a blue gremlin driving in your neighborhood, you called the police. The King family has always believed the blue gremlin was a bad lead. The gremlin was the biggest red herring ever in the case. No, it was not a blue gremlin. The blue gremlin uh, matter ought to be thrown out. Investigators traveled 1,200 miles to Recluse, Wyoming to exhume Norberg's body in a long shot attempt to match his DNA to a hair found on one of the four victims. In 1979, the state police assigned one detective to follow up any future leads on the case, but that was it. Inside the styrofoam cooler is hair and bone samples of suspect David Norberg. Investigators traveled 1,200 miles to Recluse, Wyoming to exhume Norberg's body in a long shot attempt to match his DNA to a hair found on one of the four victims. It might very well not be the right guy, but uh, he's a suspect, we have DNA, and you just have to come out and do this. How can you just not, uh, not do it? How do you ignore it? As the workers dig, investigators stand guard. They know that this may be their best and final chance to solve the case of the Oakland County child killer. From this Wyoming graveyard, the evidence goes to a Michigan crime lab for extensive testing. Well, the success of, of this operation will be measured by the ability of the appropriate labs to, to do the testing and hopefully the matching. Brooks Patterson was the prosecuting attorney at the time of the killings. He says closure would mean everything to the families of the young victims. We exhumed the body of a suspect and cut off some of his you know, skin and so forth. Uh, and then compared the two and it didn't match, but that's how far we went. In 2005, when it was reactivated, when I arrested Lawson. Police are not revealing the name of the mystery man from Ohio, but do say Lawson has led them to Detroit's Cass Corridor. Mr. Lawson has given us information in the past, which took uh, my partners and I down to the Cass Corridor. We've done extensive investigations down there. Lawson claims there may be other victims, Detroit children who were never linked to the case. So they were using Lawson to, in the neighborhoods to try and identify the Oakland County child killer. And uh, so Lawson started telling me about these things and about his theories and who was involved in the child killing. He had a lot of information, a lot of really good information. Um, and he talked about Sheldon and, and uh, he talked about Gerald Richards. And so he knew a lot. As police escorted Lawson out of the courthouse, we asked him the critical question. 
Do you know who the Oakland County child killer is? Yes, I believe I do. Who, who is it? No. Mr. Lam is it Mr. Lambergine? I tell you what, if, if you gentlemen want to meet with me privately, and uh, what I'd like to do is cut a What's little deal. What's wrong with now? Lawson is feeding me information. It's prior to trial uh, on the murder case, and he's talking about, um, not about his murder, but about the Oakland County child killings. He said that he was, Lawson, was at Bob Moore's apartment one time with Ted Orr and Bob Moore, and Bob Moore had a photo album on his table, coffee table, with pictures of kids in it. And Lawson claimed that um, Ted Orr picked up the photo album, opened to a certain page, and showed it to Bob Moore, and said, does that not look like the King Boy? I would also like to produce to your honor a statement by the prosecutor saying that all the information that I gave him pertaining to this would never be used against me in the court of law. You know, I'm listening to him, and uh, over several conversations, I said, are you sure? I couldn't find a Ted Orr anywhere in Detroit. I said, are you sure his name's Ted Orr? And Lawson finally told me, I think his last na real last name starts with L-A-M, Ted Lamb something. Is that your present address? Well, the jail is, but my last residence before jail was that, Your Honor. The Wayne County prosecutor says Lambergine, along with Richard Lawson, would lure young victims in the cash corridor with drugs, food, and cash, and sexually attack them. Mr. Lambergine is a suspect in the Oakland County child killer case. Um, Mr. Lambergine is our most promising uh, suspect at this particular time. Mr. Lambergine, what do you want to tell the judge in Detroit? Ted, not only didn't cooperate and not only turned down this offer, but he did something very unusual. He pled guilty straight up to all 17 counts, including three life felonies without saying a word. Um, which to all of us, we felt it was sort of telling. He was a pedophile and he had done a lot of things and I think this group, they knew it and uh, they held that over his head. You know, if you, if you tell, if you come forward with any of this stuff, we're gonna lay it out and you'll be in life, in, in prison for life. And, and, I mean, this is 1975, and Ted Lamborghini was a free man. He was a free man until 2014 or so. So for 40 years, he went about his business because these people didn't reveal what he'd been doing. Well, at that point, it became, you know, uh, the old victims came forward, now he's in prison for life, but he had 40 years of freedom that he wouldn't have had. Getting away with murder, that's what several cold-blooded killers thought they had accomplished. Now, decades after the crime, they're suddenly being locked up. It bothered some of my uh, children more than, than others and, and me. Uh, we had various reactions to it. Now armed with new information, King says he believes he's cracked this case wide open himself. The Birmingham attorney now revealing he believes the guy in this mugshot, Christopher Bush, a known pedophile who was convicted several times of sexually assaulting children in 1977, is the Oakland County child killer. He paid a lot of money to get this information, which has been, uh, through him, uh, much of it put out uh, into the public domain, and it's very helpful. And it's interesting, once they got the Chris Bush name and, and you know, Corey starts looking through the files, just this avalanche of evidence came. He'd been arrested and convicted four times of you know, sex with minors and got off on each charge. I didn't think Chris Bush was probably capable of the abductions and the killings themselves. I mean, he was just a slob in and of himself and I didn't think was probably articulate and crafty enough, if you will, to pull this off. Uh, but to be someone's fall guy and be part of the bigger picture, absolutely. And likewise, Greg Green, he had a record a mile long. And here, I think he was in Michigan, but yet California was trying to bring him back there for crimes that had been committed. He takes a polygraph and he passes the polygraph. 
and Greg Green passed the polygraph too. And for some reason, he gets deals all over the state while Greg Green, for the same charge, goes to prison for life. He was the son of a prominent General Motors executive. Mr. Bush was a vice president in General Motors. His connections and his uh, power in the community helped get his son off the hook. He had supposedly committed suicide and then it, within the same uh, documents that I requested states that the task force was disbanded within like three days of his supposed suicide. So I remember thinking at that point that's total bullshit. So this person offs himself supposedly and then all of a sudden the task force had gone to his home where the incident had happened and then a couple of days later they disbanded. He was found shot in his bedroom in his house. On the wall of his bedroom was his pencil drawing. It's a young boy screaming. When I first saw that, I'm like, yeah. That looks exactly like my brother being sodomized. I cannot ever make a declaration that someone who is not living is guilty of something. I don't make declarations of, of guilt. When I was a judge, I could make declarations if the case was tried in front of me. But the only person who can determine that someone is guilty is a judge or a jury upon a complaint and warrant that's brought in a court of law. And I tell you that because as, as much as there are people who say, just tell me he did it, I cannot legally do that. Local 4 News begins right now with a breaking news alert. Finally, a break in the case that's had investigators baffled for 36 years. A stunning new development today in the Oakland County child killer investigation. Those hairs recovered from the boys' bodies have the same MT DNA profile as the hair recovered from the 1966 Pontiac Bonneville. And now the search is on for this new suspect. Investigators say this man is a direct link to the suspect, but they still need help finding the killer. They still don't have enough evidence to indicate that this guy Sloan's involved, but they, they believe that there's a distinct possibility. They had pulled a hair off of Chris's blouse, and I think then that was part of the relationship. But I thought Sloan was a good lead, and I, I would, the fam, my family encouraged follow up on it. But nothing's been turned over to us to indicate that uh, any of that stuff was true. The theory was that Christopher Bush knew Mr. Gunnels. Mr. Gunnels was being used as a lure to bring Timothy King into the car, and that's how he was abducted. When we approach Gunnels, we tell him we're from Local 4 News and are surprised when he opens up and starts talking. My heart goes out to those families, so it really, really, really does. I don't feel that, uh, I don't feel that they were served justice to any of this. So, let's make it clear. This hair that M Mr. King has talked about, Christopher Bush is excluded. He is not a contributor. Mr. Gunnels could be, but the statistical odds are about 1 in 150, which when you expand that out to all the population of Michigan at the time is hundreds of thousands of people. Every time, whether it was Lambergine or Norberg or Bush or, 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 or Sloan, the family, you want to talk about pain, that, that's what we do. And so you, you try and be as... Uh, uh, circumspect as you possibly can because you're hurting that hurts the pain the pain is never going to go away and 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 when you're talking about the investigation it becomes even rawer and so you can see what's happened to some of the individuals who respond to this type of pain differently mr. King seems to think that the authorities are covering something up and that maybe they have some sort of answer that we should know about um, 
I, I, I'm not willing to go that far. I hope Mr. King lives long enough, though, to see this case solved. My family's not very confident about it, but I would, I, th I feel even worse not knowing the answer is the fact that the people who looked into it after 40 years won't talk about it. They deserve that. Yeah, I hope it's solved for his sake. Somebody can go and tell him. Denise Powell and Becky MacArthur from the State Police, Sean Callahan and Brooke Glennon from the FBI, our whole team of investigators from our office, Kim Worthy and Rob Moran, have done <laughs> so much work and it's been blood, sweat and tears to advance this case. We're all disappointed we haven't solved it yet, but I'm telling you right now, this case can be solved and I believe it will be.